And now your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to It's a Miracle. We're here at Britain's National Maritime Museum for a special edition of Miracles on the High Seas. This museum houses one of the world's most important collections of sailing history, and we're going to add to that collection with some remarkable stories of our own. We begin with one of the most grueling sailboat races in the world, the Von D. Globe, an event that tests the limits of man's strength, courage, and faith. The Von D. Globe is an annual four-month-long round-the-world race which passes through the southern ocean surrounding Antarctica, considered to be one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Hurricane force winds and waves the size of houses lash out against anything that gets in their way. It's a grueling challenge and a demanding job for a full crew, and yet there are some who choose to race alone. One of these intrepid sailors is Pete Goss, a former Royal Marine. I wanted to do the Von D because it was the ultimate challenge. It is a very hard race. Statistically, only 50% of the fleet would finish it. But um, I had no fear at all. I couldn't wait to go. And I was starting to fulfill a 10-year dream. What a lucky person. Mm. The race began off the coast of France. Among the contestants, 28-year-old Frenchman Raphael Dinelli, the youngest of the 16 starters. For his first solo race around the world, Raphael had the full support of his wife, Virginie. I gave up everything to help him because I wanted to share it with him. We always shared everything, so it's a family project. <laughs> Pete Goss would be keeping a video diary chronicling his adventures. You film what you're doing and you talk to it and how you feel and so on. And it actually becomes a friend. <laughs> you start talking to this bloody piece of equipment. Well, as you can see, today is a, a very convenient day. There's a lot of things to be done. You have to cook, clean, look after yourself. Uh, you have to do a lot of maintenance. That takes a lot of your time up. And then, of course, just physically sailing the boat, getting on deck, changing sails. You have to be fit uh, and you have to be motivated. The first few weeks of the race took the boat south toward the equator. Well, here we are. Look at that. Run down the boom, nice sunny day. And hey ho diddly. There's the competition. Fantastic. Rafael Dinelli was keeping up with the pack, but already experiencing difficulties. Faxes received by his wife indicated that his boat, the Algimus, was having problems with its ballast tank. Communications uh, nowadays are very, very sophisticated, and you can send a fax anywhere in the world and people can fax you. We also have a form of safety communication, what we call an EPIRB, and it's a, a sealed unit. It's very, very rugged and you can, you can flick a switch and a mayday and a position goes out. So if everything goes down, you're able to say, I'm in trouble, I need help, and this is where I am. At the moment, the leaders, Aquitaine Innovation is here. By then, the, the race had, had split into two groups and we were in the, in the group further behind. And we are, um, we're here. Nothing like a bit of competition. <laughs> Raphael's next communication revealed that on December 21st, Pete Goss had changed course and passed the Algimus heading 54 degrees south into iceberg territory. The sea temperature is down to uh, zero degrees and um, it's very cold. I've got driving snow on deck. The Southern Ocean represents the worst part of any round the world trip because that is where you get these very vicious storms. It was very intimidating. The wind went straight up to 50, 60 knots. The slowest I could make the boat go was 28, 30 knots. So it was all on the edge of control. I checked the boat, I knew everything was okay. There was nothing more I could do. And I just felt uncomfortable. But I had this awful premonition coming 
which was really quite unpleasant. On board the Algimus, Raphael was also fighting against the approaching storm when suddenly his boat was hit by a 30-foot wave, turning it upside down. The boat had been designed to right itself automatically, but when that didn't happen, Raphael quickly sent an SOS. RCC Australia, good evening. The signal was received uh, ahead, in France itself, in Europe, and relayed to us from the Maritime Rescue Centre. What's been happening, Ian? Uh, there's a yacht named Algemus, one person on board whose name Denali. Raphael was approximately 1,200 miles southwest of Fremantle, Western Australia. The situation posed a real problem. The nearest merchant ship was 34 hours away. So we issued a May Day to see if there was any shipping in the area which could lend immediate assistance to that vessel. The signal was picked up by Pete's communication system. I called up the message and it was a May Day. And the definition of that is that it's a life-threatening situation. I never thought it would be one of the competitors. I don't know why. And then the alarm went again, which basically said, Raphael is in trouble. What's your position and what's your situation? The problem was I was 160 miles from Raphael, but I was downwind. I would have to turn around and, and take this boat back into what were pretty, pretty horrific conditions, and it wasn't designed for it. At 065, I had a real concern that if Pete didn't turn back into those conditions, we may have lost Raphael. It was Pete or bust. I, I sat down and I just thought through all the ramifications and, and the risks involved, and you think of your family and all the rest of it. But it's, to me, I'm sure it's different with everyone. It, it would just flashed up like a signpost. You, you either stand by your principles or you don't. So when I first turned the boat round, I just watched the guardrails go under and, and the spreaders, you know, touch the water. I found that um, as waves were hitting the boat, I was being thrown around and was starting to get injured. I wasn't in control of the situation by then. The storm had taken control of events. I had to tie myself into, a, into the bunk in around the corner because I was being thrown around. If I was having troubles on the boat, how could he possibly be surviving, really? The remarkable conclusion when It's a Miracle returns. Coming up, Pete's search continues with some help from the air. It was a race against time, because you can only survive for so long in those conditions. We had to find him as quickly as possible. He could have been sunk, he could be dead. We just didn't know at that stage. What I was really hungry for was information. I just wanted his position. I would get a position roughly every, every two hours would come in, so I knew effectively where I was going. But time was running out for Raphael. His boat had endured a continuous pounding by giant waves and was sinking fast. Worse still, during the night, his life raft had been swept overboard, leaving him with no means of escape. It was a race against time, because you can only survive for so long in those conditions. We had to find him as quickly as possible. As an added precaution, rescue coordinators in Australia sent a surveillance plane loaded with life rafts and supplies to search for the sinking boat. After flying for several hours, the rescue aircraft reached the search area nearly a full day after Raphael had capsized. Our thinking was that uh, he could have been sunk, he could be dead. We just didn't know at that stage. Visibility was about half a mile to a mile in the area, and we're flying in and, and we couldn't see anything. We had uh, observers in several observer stations back through the aeroplane, looking out the window, searching. I was in the left-hand seat. The engineer was, was between us. So we're looking, we're looking, we're looking. And then, uh, yeah, suddenly... I didn't know what I was seeing. 
I just saw a dark outline of something sticking out of the water. We started getting some pretty excited calls from other guys in the aeroplane. Holy cow, there's a guy sitting standing on the deck of that yacht. There was this guy just, just waving, just waving. That's pretty amazing. The aircraft's not designed to rescue people. We can drop them uh, safety equipment and uh, life rafts and food and so on, but we can't actually pick them up. Stand by, 10 seconds. The crew would attempt to drop the life raft as close to Rafael as possible. Miraculously, it came within yards of his boat, close enough that he was able to grab it in spite of the terrible conditions. He quickly attached it to the boat as an anchor and jumped inside. We had to leave him at that point and go and find Peter and uh, relay the information to him. I was on deck repairing the boat having got through the night when I heard the aeroplane. Uh, rescue aircraft, uh, rescue aircraft. This is Mike Victor, Foxtrot Zulu 8. Do you receive me, over? This is uh, Rescue 251, receiving you loud and clear, over. Uh, rescue 251, oh, it's just great to hear a voice. Listen, I need as much information as possible. And that was great. That's the first time I'd spoken to someone for over a month. Um, now, is there anybody else involved in the rescue? Uh, no, sir, we're uh, pinning our hopes on you. By then, I was, I was getting pretty tired and pretty numb. But um, it added to my resolve, I think. All right, brilliant. Well, best get on then. Take care. Happy Christmas. Everyone's just going, did he just wish us Merry Christmas? And it's like, this guy's just amazing. Roger, and Merry Christmas to you, sir. By now, the plane had only enough fuel to return to land, and so it headed home. Within hours, photographs of Raphael taken from the rescue plane were seen around the world. When we saw the picture the day after in the newspaper, we all realized that it was really uh, in big trouble. Trapped on a life raft in the turbulent seas, Raphael's muscles began to cramp up. He had not eaten or slept since his boat first capsized days earlier. I got back to his vicinity at about midnight on the second night. I was just questioning whether he would be alive and what would I tell his wife and, and child. I would box search an area and then two hours later another position would come through and I would search that area and then another position would come through and it was really looking for a, a needle in a haystack. Because of the drift, the position would move and it might only move a quarter of a mile but in those conditions it just as well be a hundred miles. I could, I could feel his presence. I knew he was there, but I couldn't find him. I got so tired that I, I couldn't think straight. And, and I got a position in, and I plotted it, and uh, it put him 60 miles away, and it was absolutely crushing. And, and I thought, hang on, that, that, that can't be possible. And, and I went on deck. It's the first time <laughs> I was grateful the Southern Ocean was cold, so I just got a bucket of water and stuck my head in it. and. Um, he, you know, got some fresh air and, and went back down and replotted the position. And I got one degree out, which is 60 miles. Probably I was within a 14-mile radius, so I was never more than seven miles away from him. In an attempt to aid his search, a second Australian Air Force plane took off three hours before daybreak, hoping to reach the area at first light. We saw our primary role then was to uh, get Peter to the life raft in the uh, quickest possible manner and ensure Raphael was rescued. We have him uh, visual, three miles from your position. We've got smoke flares to guide you in. Foxtrot Zulu 8. Oh. It was great to have somebody else there. And the, the key with them is they had a bird's eye view of the area. And there's just great grayness. The sea is gray, the sky is gray. I still couldn't see him, although I was very close. To help Pete get his bearings, the rescue plane flew above Raphael's life raft and flashed its landing lights. And that gave me something concrete, and I took a quick compass bearing on it, and then I could sail in on that. This is a rescue at two, uh, five, uh, two, uh, 400 yards over. The seas were quite big, 
and it was incredible how close he was before I could see him. With the life raft now in sight, Pete lowered his sails and maneuvered his boat into position. The next phase was to get him on the boat. That's a high-risk part of the, of the exercise. And it was made even riskier by the rough seas and Raphael's exhausted condition. Once he was clipped to the boat, I knew I had him then. All I could see was his eyes. I'll never forget his eyes and, and the de depth of emotion and gratitude. The word uh, from Peter was basically that uh, Raphael was uh, happy, a little bit cold in places. So uh, we were pretty happy with the situation then. I dragged him into the cockpit, pulled his hood off, and um, his feet were, were, were in agony, but he was lucid. Uh, and he said thanks, and he was OK. I uh, made a cup of tea with lots and lots of sugar in it and started to get fluids in him. I just wanted to go to sleep, so I was absolutely exhausted. Call, call the bateau, uh, uh, capsize. capsize. The no. trouble is they get on a survivor's high, and he was bloody rabbiting away. I couldn't shut him up because he was talking in French, and I, I couldn't understand him. But it was the beginning of a... Of a, of a great friendship. With Raphael safely on board, Pete headed for Hobart, Australia, 10 days away. Already, the rescue was making headlines around the world. Do you feel, do you feel like a hero? In Hobart, Pete bid Raphael farewell and headed back out to sea to rejoin the race. And, um, I felt really quite vulnerable and, and it was the first time on the race that I felt lonely really. And it took a lot of resolve to head back down into the Southern Ocean. Two and a half months later, Pete finished the Vendee Globe and Raphael Danelli was there to welcome him home. I was unaware of the extent of the interest in the rescue until the finish. And apparently there was 150,000 people there which was just incredible. In June of 1997, Pete Goss was awarded the Légion d'honneur, France's highest civilian honor. The Légion d'honneur really touched me. It came from France and it came from the heart. It was absolutely brilliant. And it was absolutely deserved, for if Pete Goss had not turned back and sailed to Raphael's rescue, it is doubtful that he would have survived. There was no one else in the area capable of reaching him, and Pete's courage and determination were the stuff of miracles. As the two men sailed together for 10 days back to land, Raphael Dinelli realized what a special person his guardian angel was. In 10 days, if I knew Pete, perhaps 20 years, I think Pete is um, uh, a good friend for all my life.